I hope, I hope you guys had a good Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we were off last week. My family, we went camping. Now, that was, was fun, but if you know nothing about me, we are not outdoors people, okay? That camping uh, for us is, like, I don't understand why we necessarily go camping. Like, for me, camping is, we if we have the windows open in the house, sleep with the windows open in the house, that's like camping. Okay? My idea of roughing it when we go on vacation is going from a five-star resort down to a four-star resort. Okay, so camping is just outside of our normal bubble, but we went ahead and, and did it anyway. And I don't know if you've ever had moments in your life where your life kind of flashes before your eyes, but I had a couple moments during our camping experience where my life flashed before my eyes. One was on the way there. We got lost, and we were camping in the backwoods near Superfu, like way out of nowhere. We were down a, a dirt road, like 30 minutes down a dirt road. There's no signs, like road names or anything like that. You're basically trying to find like little signs. There's a lake. Turn left at the lake and this sort of stuff. And we were lost. Like lost, lost. And as a guy, if you're driving and you're lost, lost, like you don't want to admit that you're lost. Like you just don't go in we're good. Except till we're 30 minutes into this dirt road and it's rough terrain, no cell signal, and then the road just stops. Like there's a, there's a fence at the end of the road and a giant pile of rocks and it's like you ain't going nowhere. And so at this point, my manhood's at stake because I'm like, I gotta, I'm lost, I don't know. And out of nowhere, this guy, we're in the middle of nowhere, and this guy just appears by uh, our passenger side window where Reed is sitting, and we have our windows down, and he goes, y'all lost? Now again, my manhood's at stake, so I'm sitting there going, not lost, you know, and, and Rita gives him a man, my man card and says, oh yeah, we're lost. Now this guy is a rough looking dude, and we notice that he has like a, a knife on him, and, and like, a, like not just a knife, like a, a crocodile Dundee knife, like oh, this is a knife, I'm not a knife. Some of you guys, you don't even know who crocodile Dundee is, but anyway, like it was a little bit, and so um, check in my man card, we're lost, and we said, well, we're looking for a carless place. It's a remote place, maybe you know of a Carla. And he goes, Oh, Carla? I'm like, yeah, Carla. That's my ex wife. Right. And my life flashes before my eyes. I'm like, This is it. This is how it ends. We drive to the middle of nowhere, and this brand, we're lost, and this random dude just takes us out. Fortunately, the gentleman was super nice, even though he looked really rough and scary. And he directed us, he's like, go to the lake, take a ride, find the fire department, take a left, and we're going straight, you're good to go. We found it, right? So we get to Carla's place. And she owns this meadow, and it's just absolutely gorgeous. 360 views of mountains all around, and we get to camp there for the evening. Um, and as we're setting up, she owns a farm. And she owns, on her farm, this ranch is just a bunch of open-range cows and sheep. And so we're like, okay, that's cool. Um, let's, let's go check out the animals. And then as we're getting close to the cows, they're kind of all congregating around. One of the cows stares me in the eyes. And now my manhood is at stake here. And I'm like, oh, no, cow. <laughs> you, ain't, you ain't looking at me like that. Like, you're going to come at me and my family? Like, I'm, gonna, I'm the dad. I'm going to protect. And then he takes a step towards me. And then I check in my man card, and I run. <laughs> I trip my kid, <laughs> and then I keep on going. My life flashed before my eyes with a cow. Listen, um, as we talk about uh, dying and death today, we don't know exactly how we're going to die, but we do know that we will die. Like, death is batting uh, a thousand. It's, it's, a, it's a guarantee. We know this is going to happen. We just don't know exactly how. Statistically speaking, by cow, um, death by cow, uh, roughly 20 people in the United States this year will die by cow. It's, it, it can happen, okay? So I'm not, I'm not just crazy when I'm trying to look at these cows. Um, just slightly up from that, in Africa, ants. 50 people in Africa roughly will die this year from ants. That just creeps me out um, that that could happen. 
Now, for some of you, you're going on vacation this, this, this summer, and you're going to the beach. You're going to the beach. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we're all jealous of you. It's all right. It's all right. Um, now, you might be thinking sharks. Yeah. What's the likelihood of death by shark? The United States average is about one person in the U.S. will die uh, by shark attack. That's not your biggest threat when you go to the beach. You want to know? One of your biggest threats? Coconuts. 150 people die per year from falling coconuts. Watch out as you're sitting underneath that hammock under that palm tree by the beach from those deadly coconuts. We don't know how we will die. We know that we will die. And so today I want to talk about um, what happens one minute after we die. And this is not necessarily a fun subject. Like, obviously, I'm joking about it. And I would much rather just joke about it, um, laugh about it, there's, uh, than, than talk about it or think about it. But we would be foolish to go through life when we have eternity on our brain. Like, we all want to know what is on the other side. Like, every single one of us, we question it, we wonder. We may believe different things, but we want to know. It, it would serve us well to think about these things. And for some of us, it's no joke. Because when we talk about death, it's one of the most painful things that, that subjects that we've dealt with. The grief of losing a loved one, a friend. We've lost parents. We've lost a spouse. We've lost a sibling. We've lost a child. And it is no joke. Jesus, this reminds me of Jesus when his one of his good friends, Lazarus, died. And we know that Jesus raised him from the dead, but before he raised him from the dead, it says that Lazarus has been dead for four days and Jesus shows up on the scene and everybody's grieving and everybody's weeping. And it says when Jesus saw her being married and he saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled. Death. Jesus and his enemy. And so as we go through things today, the pain and the grief that we feel is real and should be there because it is not part of God's created order. Yet we have hope today that that is not the finality. That is not the end of us. There's a lot of hope in the message despite the, the, the pain that we feel. And I'm going to go over some factual things with you today. That's not going to diminish the pain. That's not the goal of this. I'm not going to say if you're grieving, get over your grief or it's a life of process. We're going to go through some factual stuff. I'm going to teach a little bit and then I'm going to preach a little bit with you guys today. But you need to know that death is an enemy. But it has been the Now, a theme through this series has been what you believe about eternity. What you believe about the afterlife determines how you live today. And you might have a lot, we have, we have a lot of different beliefs in the, just represented in this room on what we believe is going to happen after we die. Maybe you might believe, hey, there is no God. Like we just, when we die, we're done. We're nothing but dust. And again, I get hung up on that. What is but dust? I'm not sure. It just sounds gross and weird. Okay. But that, that just may be it. And so you just, the I, I don't know what you fill your life with, but you just fill the years that you're alive with something, with stuff, joy or, or whatever, but that, that's it. And then it's done. Or maybe you, you have a belief in the afterlife that everybody goes to heaven. Like there's a God that just, everybody goes. It's a, it's a universal idea and everyone goes in. That sounds great. But then we would, it, it starts to crack and fall because we have an inner sense of justice within us that would be like Hitler? Are you sure? Like Hitler's party in heaven right now? With all the millions of people that he led to slaughter? Like they're all the, like that just, something within our justice system knows that that, if there's a God that allows that, that that's, that's just wrong. Or maybe it's reincarnation. Like there's people that are like, hey, I believe, you, you know, what you once, what you love now is maybe what you once were. And I had a friend of mine that would uh, carpool with a group of people and there was uh, one person in the carpool group that really believed in reincarnation, 
and there was another guy that really did not believe in reincarnation. They would always push the envelope and push the envelope. And she would she would say, hey, I believe in reincarnation. And I once loved, Fra I love France and I love uh, trees. So I believe in a former life, I was a tree in France. And so she would push on, I want to know what you were. What were you? And one guy was like, okay, well, I like, a, I like women. So maybe in a former life, I was a, a group of women. Um, and the other guy was like, no, I don't want to answer. And they're kind of button heads and I don't want to answer so I don't believe it. She finally forced it on him and he's like, fine, fine, okay? I think we met in a formal life. And she's like, what, really, really? And he's like, well, I love France and I love dogs. And I think I lived near your tree. And whenever I would go outside, I think we met in a formal life. <laughs> and then they did, you know, they kind of butted heads. But it was, that, maybe that's not how as a Christian, we have beliefs about the afterlife. And what I want to give us a foundation for what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to hammer this home on almost every single Sunday, what we're going to talk about seems crazy. It seems almost unbelievable. There's some stuff as I've been studying and research. I'm just scratching my head like, ah, okay, but this is, this is what I believe, and here's why. Because Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah, who worked tons of miracles and healed people, he died. But he didn't stay dead. As Christians, we believe in the resurrection. That what we believe in, there is actual evidence to show that this is the way. This is the afterlife. What your beliefs in in the afterlife has a foundation. Not just in what appears what the Bible says, but its foundation is found in the, the first-hand accounts of people who witnessed the life of Jesus. And then they recorded everything about it to say, this is the man. If anybody knows about the afterlife, it's this guy, Jesus. So what we're going to study builds off of that foundation of, of, the, of the Bible, people who, who wrote down what Jesus said, what he did. They saw him die, and then they saw him alive, and then they saw him rise into heaven. And that's why you can have hope today that one of the most tragic events that you'll face in life, death, has been conquered. Death, where is your sting? It is gone because it has been defeated by Jesus. No one else who has ever walked this planet has ever done that. So if we put our foundation in anything else, it's going to be shaky. It's going to be scary. There's not going to be much hope. But our hope today, what we're going to talk about, is going to talk about three things that happen one minute after we die. We can have hope in it, not just because, but because Jesus rose from the dead. The people saw it. The first thing, if you're taking notes, that I want to share with you today is our physical bodies, when we die, they die. Our physical bodies die, and our souls keep on living. Now, there's a lot of different scriptures that we can look at. We're going to anchor in today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because a lot of what we want to talk about kind of is, is summarized here. And in, and in verse 1 of chapter 5 in 2 Corinthians, it says, For we know that when this, in the, when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die, and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies, and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. And so, this is written by a man named Paul. Paul was a tent maker, and so he uses an illustration of a tent. And he says, your body, your physical body, it dies. It's like a tent. It's going to go away. But your soul, one minute after you die, you don't actually die. Your soul keeps on living. And so he makes a distinction between your body and your soul. Your physical body dies. Your soul keeps on living. I'm going to steal an illustration that my wife once did in youth group one time. This is one of my favorite candies of all time. A Reese's Peanut Butter Cup candy, all right? So it, it, I hear some amens right there. All right, there we go. All right, I get you fired up. All right, I'm tempted right now to just dive into this thing. So, this is our body. This is us right now. When we die, the way Paul kind of describes it is, 
we kind of have this outside wrapper. And our physical body would be represented by this outside wrapper. It's an outer shell. That this is all it is. And so when we die, this wrapper is done. But then the inside, the good stuff, the soul keeps on living. Now, if you're a believer, we believe that the soul would then go to heaven. And so, as we talked about last, or two weeks ago, in, in week one of the sermon series, we said we spent so much of our life focused on this wrapper. Well, I want to make this wrapper look good, and I want to invest in there. And Jesus says, don't put your treasures here on earth, in the physical, in the wrapper. No, no, no. He says, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. He says, you know, the things of the soul are the things that are of eternity, that are most important. You can't eat this thing because it is delicious. Man, it is good. And it was in my illustration. Now, next week we're going to talk about what happens in the end. The end game. When Jesus comes back. A little bit of, of, of a preview. The body, or the, the, the scriptures talk about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that when Jesus comes back, that your soul will then be reunited, not with the physical body, but with a, a, a heavenly body, this house that Paul's talking about. Don't ask me to explain it. Scripture's not very clear on how it's all going to go down, but it says that you're going to get a new body, that, that it will be a heavenly body, an eternal body, one that, not like our physical one, that won't get tired or weary or anything like that, but they will at some point be reunited. I'm getting some some weird faces, and this is the part where it's like, okay, I, this is weird to me, but this is what it says. It says your body dies, your physical body dies, the wrapper goes away, and your soul lives on. When Jesus comes back, your soul will be reunited with some type of heavenly glorious body. That's what Paul said. It says we have an earthly tent. It's taken down when we die, but there's a house that's a lot more permanent, a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human. And we grow weary in our present bodies, but we long to put our heavenly bodies on like new clothing. Second thing that happens in God says the believer's soul is in the presence of Jesus. Paul goes on to say in verse 6, he says, So we are always confident that even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. So he said, We ain't home yet. Well, I know, I know. I'm not home. I wish I was at home with Jesus right now. Yes, we are fully confident. Notice the confidence that he has in this. He says, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. Have you ever had those moments? Jesus, take the wheel, please. I mean, Jesus, come back, please. All right, he says, we would rather be away from these earthly bodies. For then we will be at home with the Lord. Some of your translations say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you die, as a believer, Scripture says you're immediately in the presence of Jesus. Jesus, think about him when he was on the cross, hanging on the cross with the two thieves, the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. And one of the criminals who is there, said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And do you remember what Jesus said to that thief on the cross on when he would see him? He said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. He had no time to make up for his sin. He's one of the, the crucifixion was, was reserved for the worst of the worst. And Jesus says, today, you're going to be with me in paradise today. Now, some of you, you might have different backgrounds. You might be thinking, well, what about uh, purgatory? I've heard of purgatory before. Uh, what about someone who's praying for a dead person? Or some, you know, someone might say a prayer for someone. I'm not trying to be offensive. I know we have a lot of friends from a lot of different backgrounds that are here. And I'm going to tell you what I think. And you are free to believe different things. But I'm going, to, I'm going to try to teach what Scripture says here. And one of the things when it comes to purgatory, I haven't grown up with a Catholic background, so I'm not saying I know everything about Catholicism. But basically the idea behind purgatory, it is a place 
of intermediate state after physical death for purification. It is the idea that, hey, you have some sins that need to be uh, atoned for. You can't quite make it into heaven yet, and you're going to have to stay here until those are taken care of. A lot of that comes from what's called the Apocrypha, which we personally, this church, does not um, use as scripture. There's a lot of, what we would say, is a lot of great historical evidence in there, but I actually teach some things that are contradictory to the New Testament, and this is one of those areas. And I would question, for me, and again, you can believe whatever you want, but if I'm looking at Jesus' death on the cross, and it says that he paid the price for sin, and that he removed my sin, when, I, when I'm saved, that he removed my sin as far from the east is from the west, that he remembers my sin no more, and that seems to be what scripture says then it wouldn't really make sense as to why I would have to pay for more sins after I die. What would be the point of Jesus dying on the cross? He paid for some of my sins? No, Scripture seems to indicate that he paid them all. Once for all. Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite chapters in Scripture, says in the first verse of Romans chapter 8, it says, there is no condemnation for those who are there's none. Now, we put condemnation on ourselves, but in God's eyes, there's no more condemnation. And it says later in Romans 8, 38, it says, not even life or death can separate you from the love of God. So if you are in Christ, you can have assurance that he loves you. And there's, there's nothing, nothing that will separate you from his love. So, do I believe in purgatory? No. Do you? Again, you can. I just don't see the ev evidence. And I would think you have to do some fancy footwork to get it. Scripture seems to say that if you're in Christ, you're in Christ. That is great news. That you don't have to work for it, earn it, save life. The third thing I want to share with you is that we will all face judgment. This is where it goes politically and correctly. Paul goes on to say, he says, so whether we're here in this body, so we're here, or away from this body, our goal is to please him. Our goal is not to make lots of money, to be successful, to be YouTube famous, get a record number of likes on our Instagram account. No, our goal in life, your goal in life is to please Jesus. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. A little research on that Greek word, all. It means all. And we will all stand there before Christ. Now, there's two types. This is going to lean in a little bit into next week. Um, when you go to heaven, like in, or when you die, there's almost like an immediate judgment. Like it's just the, you're in heaven, or you're cast away in hell, away from God, separated forever. But, Scripture says when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a different a little bit more public judgment. The, 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 your eternity will already be solidified after your death. But there's another judgment that Scripture talks about. I want to kind of show you what that is and explain it. Revelation chapter 20 talks about this end time judgment. And we're going to talk about the end times next week. There's a great white throne judgment. One of the judgments is the great white throne. And most scholars would say the great white throne is reserved for those who do not believe in Christ. And here's why. It says, and I saw, this is John, one of Jesus' best friends, who, who saw Jesus live, who saw Jesus die, who saw Jesus resurrect, and now he's getting a vision of heaven in the end times, and he explains it in the book of Revelation. He says, I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, that's Jesus. And the earth and sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide, and there will be no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were including the book of life. And anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. A lot of us might think that heaven is the new place. And that would be nice, but scripture doesn't point towards heaven being the default. I know it's not really correct to say, but we do believe in a place called hell. 
It is a real place to believe in heaven and to believe in hell. That's why Jesus came. Why did Jesus even come? Because you're like anybody. Anybody. You are free, he said. You're free to live this life. But I don't want you to choose hell. I want you to choose a relationship with me. Now this book of life says anyone whose name was found in the, was not found in this book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This, if your name is in this book, means you're a believer. But you are in this book by grace, through faith, and it's not of works. You didn't earn your way in there. You are in there by grace. So the great white throne judgment, we would say, would be reserved for those who are non-believers. The judgment seat of Christ is the second judgment. This one's for believers. Going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this. He says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. So for believers, you will be judged, but you're not going to be condemned. We already covered that. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are saved by grace alone, but you are rewarded for your works. So this is a judgment that, that Jesus will judge us, but you will be receiving a reward in this judgment. What, 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 what am I going to be judged on? How did you do it? You invested, you're going to look at you and say, you invested in people. And those kids, and you made a difference in their lives. And I saw it. I saw the way that you talked to people and served people. But you didn't just serve the people who were like you. The people who were 180 degrees different from you, who, who had 180 degree political views, religious views, different views, and I saw the way you talked to them and treated them and loved them and served them just like I loved them. I saw the way you prayed and you prayed. You the brightest light in your office. And I know you didn't have much, but you gave. And when any, when no one was watching you, I saw your faithfulness. You had an eternal treasure, and you shared it with the spiritually bankrupt world. See, Paul wanted us to see heaven not as a destination, but a motivation for how we live. So the three things that we know that Scripture kind of teaches, even though it's vague, but this is what we know when we die. Our physical bodies die, but our souls keep on living. Our believer, the believer's soul is in the presence of Jesus, and we will all face judgment. It's just which type of judgment will you face? I want to ask a question as we round this out. How certain are you? How certain are you of your eternity? Jesus says this. It's one of the most scariest verses in scripture, Matthew chapter 7, seven, he says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. On judgment day, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesy in your name. We cast out demons in your name. Perform many miracles in your name. That's a good resume list. I don't have that on my resume. And they ain't making it in. See what he, he says, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. How certain are you? Your certainty level will depend on what you're depending on. Is it good works? Talk to a lot of people. Where are you going to go? Heaven? Why? good. It's better than most. Like, I'm not axe murderer, serial killer, Hitler. Like, you know, I'm good. I donated. I went to church. What's wrong with that? Listen, if you actually go down that logic, it does not make much sense. Think about that God. The, hey, just good people go in. If that's, if that's the reality, then the God, that God is an evil God. Because how good is good enough? And what's my scorecard right now, God? Because you're silent on that. I don't know. Like, is it 10% good enough of my life gets me in? Do I got to be 90% good enough in my life? And that, like, what is it? Like, and it would be nice if there was a sign so I could know. 
And that God is not the God of Christianity, if you believe it, because the thief on the cross, think of him. He had no time to make up for his bad works. And Jesus says, you're in. And so Jesus is like, the bad dudes are in. And the religious guys, the, the guys who like followed the Bible to the T, he's like, you guys are out. Like, it's, back, it's backwards. How good is good enough? It's a shaky foundation. I don't know. Maybe it's not sinning. Maybe I believe in God, but, you know, uh, um, I, I, just, I just need to, to not die with sin in my life. Rita and I, once, we were on a plane, and we were, we were reading. I don't know why we had a Bible. Maybe we thought we were going to die. I don't know what the statistics are on, on, on dying on a plane, but for some reason we had a Bible with us, and we were reading it, and the guy sitting next to us, he goes, hey, are you guys Mormon? And that was a, like a side conversation. We're like, no, we're not Mormon. We're Christian. But um, anyway, we started talking, and, and his, his, his big deal was he thought you could lose your salvation. He said, okay, well, how does that work? Tell us. We want to know. And he explained some things to us. And basically it came down to, if you die with sin, one sin, you're out. He said, well, Reed goes, well, are you good then? And he's like, yeah, yeah I, think, I think I'm good. And then my wife, I love her. She goes, you know, we are going through the airport today, and there was a lot of just really good-looking ladies around. And some of them weren't wearing, a, like, a ton of clothes, like, you sure you're doing all right? And this dude's face just fell. Oh, it was shaky. He didn't know. Can I tell you, God wants you to know. Satan wants you to wonder and waver and waffle. I don't know. Am I good enough? Will I ever be good enough? Do I got to do all these rules and all these things? No, that's not the God we serve. John. One of Jesus' best friends, he said this, he says, I've written this. This is in 1 John chapter 5. I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. You have it. Go live it. Don't wonder. This is yours. It's a gift. How do I know? All those guys did so many good things. They did so many good things. They did so many good things, and they didn't make it in. What makes you so certain, Mike? It's the reason that he gave them. He says, I never knew you. Jesus, the foundation, is a relationship. That's it. That's what I love about Christianity. It levels the playing field. Oh, you've got more sin. I'm better than you. Oh, you're, you're, you're gay. You're transgender. You're, you're African-American. You're white. You're, you're Republican. You're Democrat. You're this. You're that. Like, he's like, no! Quit that! Relationship for everybody. I love everyone. I don't want anyone to go to hell. I came to this earth so that you don't have to go there. It's for everyone. And you're hearing that message today that he loves you. Stop focusing on the rapper. Get to the good stuff. The eternal stuff. And that's your foundation. The foundation of the thief on the cross wasn't in his good works. It was on forgiveness. Bad people don't go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. If you're in Christ, you've said, I believe in you, Jesus. I want a relationship. I'm not perfect. My foundation isn't in my perfection. It's in his perfection. That's it. That's it. I don't know much about the afterlife. A lot of generalities. But I'm banking on the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a relationship with him. And if you don't have that today, if you're unsure of that today, it's often for every single one of us. And for those of you who have a relationship with Jesus, he says, go out there and live it. That there's a world, a spiritually bankrupt world, that's trying to earn it, that's seeking, and they're wondering, and they've lost him. That helps you. That's what you do. So with that in mind, can you pray?